Okay, greetings, folks. Uh, as you all know, and you can see on the screen, I'm Nate Angel. Let me get myself centered here on the screen uh, from Hypothesis. And um, sorry for the late start, but as usual, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, which seems to be happening in every session today, which is fun. No, no, we, we won't point fingers. No pointing fingers. Um, it's all good. We've all had technical difficulties, especially over this last year when we've been asked to do so much um, unusual things. Even though we're all so used to it, there's still the possibility of national. Yes, it's National Technical Difficulties Day, as Franny points out. So <laughs> here we are. At any rate, I'm so um, honored and pleased to be able to have these folks here with us today for this informal featured educated office hours. And so we have with us here um, Miriam Cortez Cooper, who's um, from the Rocky Mountain University of Health Professionals. I myself am a Colorado native, so I'm very happy to, to have Colorado represented in the house. Are you, you are in Colorado, Miriam? No, everybody says that Rocky Mountain is actually in Utah. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> As a Coloradan, I'm going to have to take a little bit of umbrage with that, given that the Rocky Mountains don't extend over to Utah. But we're going to let that slip for now. Um, and I'd also like to introduce um, Karen Nichols, who's from Boise State. And so we're at least representing the West here, though. Um, I'm actually located in Portland, Oregon right now. Um, so we have multiple Western states um, at play here. And uh, before, before uh, I kind of launch things off with, with our invited guests here. I just want to say that this session, we've really tried to design this to be a kind of informal drop-in, kind of almost like coffee hour, where folks who have experience using social annotation can kind of talk with folks who maybe are less experienced, and we can kind of talk about maybe things around pedagogy or practice. Um, there's a separate session that just ended uh, that's sort of for more technical details. So hopefully we won't have to delve into that too much, although we're always willing to entertain a technical question. Um, and so I thought I'd start by kicking things off um, with Miriam and ask you if you would just briefly describe what your role is at your institution and how you came to uh, know about social annotation and start using it in your practice. Yeah, um, I am an associate professor and teach in a number of courses that are all related to um, forming uh, doctoral students in physical therapy. So they're entry level students and really um, somebody came to me and said, hey, look, you want to try out this new tool? <laughs> That's really how it came down to. And I was excited to try it because I love um, having articles, journal articles that our students would have to read. And it was always kind of a, uh, you know, an issue that when students are first learning how to read an article, like how, how do you go about it? And so it was just a really easy way for me to highlight and say, oh, this is really important. So I started off there with just highlighting and, and getting students kind of I'm used to that, to then posing questions in the margin for students to have to answer. Um, and then also having, and then eventually also using it as discussion points for students to have in small groups. So that's kind of how I got into it, was just somebody asked me, you want to try it out? And I'm always willing to try anything. So that's how I did it. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's great. Um, and I, it's really, uh, I know that um, your institution was one of the first sort of um, institutions that was focused on medical education mm -hmm. that um, adopted hypothesis formally. And so you guys are kind of pioneers in that respect. And it's really been interesting to see um, other institutions focused on on medical teaching and learning have sort of picked it up. So we'll let's delve more into that in a second, but let me give Karen a chance to basically do the same thing and just introduce yourself. Let us kind of know what, what it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis there at Boise State and maybe talk about how you got to know social annotation and started using it. Sounds great. Uh, I teach in the business school at Boise State and I teach in management. Uh, predominantly strategic management, but I also have an innovation and change course. And um, I'm a recent uh, academic. Uh, I lived in the software industry before, and I love all software tools, and the more useful, the better. So it was a, um, I teach fully online courses to non-traditional students. And I'm not a huge fan of textbooks, so I like OER materials. 
But I was like, how can I get the son of a guns to read it? Um, and I was searching for a tool and our Center for Teaching and Learning put on a workshop and included in it was a blurb on hypothesis. And I thought, oh, this is good because A, I can get them to read it. You have to post, uh, um, annotate twice per each article. I can do something like that and say, you've got to do something. Um, and lo and behold, they did. So I don't know if I'm going to answer your next question, Nate, but they went so far above and beyond what I expected, what I asked for, and I was fairly vague with my, you have to annotate twice per article. And that's all I said. And they were going into these paragraphs and writing it. So last fall when we moved online, I tried it with my MBA course. And they're not as pliable, potentially, as uh, undergrads. I better be careful here. I don't know who's in our audience. Uh, but they went full in and they did the same thing. And I'm just like, I have no idea what the magic of the tool is, but I'm in. I'm, um, I'm sold. That's great. And, you know, I also, Karen, behind you, I see a guitar and I'm wondering if, do you do musical numbers at all too during your, your work? <laughs> it's it's a cello. And oh, a cello, even better. It's a cello and I have um, set myself the task of teaching myself the cello. Lessons would be much better. So at the moment, I also enjoy the view of the cello. So. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do a twinkle, twinkle. That's it. That's right. Well, maybe. More I can do. <laughs> yeah, that's more than I can do too. Uh, maybe we can have a little. Um, I think we might know, all know the words though, so maybe we can have a little session. A little bit. <laughs> I've heard that the cello is the instrument that is closest in tone to the human voice, and so I, I, I actually went to a Yo-Yo Ma concert once. Um, he, he's a pretty good cellist, I've heard. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what I really love here is that we've got two folks who are really focused on kind of professional disciplines, um, and. You know, uh, social annotation and hypothesis in particular have sort of ha maybe had their deepest roots in English and composition as disciplines um, and kind of branched out from there into, um, you know, other kinds of humanities and social studies work. But I have always had it in my mind that um, it's, it's really in a lot of the professional disciplines where um, social annotation be can become really, really valuable because I had actually originally thought of law, where so much of law is about deep textual analysis and interpretation, right? But reading is really fundamental to every discipline. And in the professional disciplines in particular, it seems like so much of what is um, necessary, and I'll get your, your thoughts on this in just a second, but so much of what is necessary is for students to start to learn how to um, work in it, think through professional um, situations and issues and concepts in a group setting with other colleagues, whereas some of the other disciplines may call for more kind of solo activity, if you will. And so I'm wondering if you found the social aspects of the annotation to be particularly fruitful um, in that kind of professional setting. And maybe start with Karen, I don't know, unless you're not ready. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um... I don't think I've taken full advantage of that yet. So it is happening organically. So at this point in time, the way I'm using the tool is I'm kind of have at it. Here's my expectations and go to town. And I've been really surprised at the conversations that have happened. So a person will post, there'll be replies, they'll go back and forth. Um, and I've been super impressed at how that's happened. I think one of the things that I like about it, I'm not totally going to answer your question, Nate, but is that I can group together articles, and they're not academic articles, Miriam, just to be, and I love your idea, and I've already been thinking about how I'm going to use that, but I'm using more like um, HBR, Harvard Business Review, just some of the more popular press articles on the profession of business, and I can put them together from different sources with different viewpoints so we can get that juxtaposition and they can discuss it between themselves. So like, here's one that's for, here's one that's against. Have at it, go go enjoy and read. Um, so that's kind of been my approach. It's worked amazingly well so far. Well, it does sound like there's kind of like a natural social conversation that's starting, whether you like it or not, right? <laughs> um, just by the virtue of the material that you pick, 
the students that you have and and the affordances of the tools. So that's that's awesome. What about you, Miriam? Is do you, have you have the social aspects stood up? I, they have just because I, you know oftentimes you get students that don't want to be wrong, you know, and so if you pose a question, you know, there's a one right answer. And when you're really trying to get away from that, when I when I pose questions in the margins of papers, like I said, I highlight it, put a question and um, I have them in uh, groups. And so then they, because we have 50 students, so having 50 students all annotate on the same question just becomes crazy. So I get them into sections. So they're usually like five students or so in each of these different sections. And so they can have these discussions uh, within their own sections, only look at those. And I, they can do it asynchronously. So I can just put that out as an assignment and, and have these questions and then students can answer them. And there's not this feeling of like, oh, there's only one right answer. They just are voicing their opinion in a way that is um, you know, related to the question I put, and there's just no, you know, there's no bad feelings about it. If, if I could just add on to that too, I tend to teach non-traditional students and that ability to share their experiences really, really comes out in the annotating, in the, oh man, this happened to me, hopefully slightly more professionally phrased, but not all the time. Um, they can give their examples and really get that social learning, which is awesome. And um, I find happens remarkably often, considering it's mm. not a requirement of the assignment. Yeah, on occasion when I'm, uh, like I said, you know, if I'm looking at like social determinants of health or something that's a lot more, um, that's not as cut and dry as some of the sciences are, um, then definitely there are those shared experiences that you're talking about, Karen. I think one of them was um, looking at the impact of sleep on overall health quality. And so some of the things you're talking about was like, okay, well, think about multifamily homes and, you know, do, is a person sleeping in their own bed? How many kids or how many people are running around and what's the outside noise and what's the ambient lighting? You know, like all of those sorts of stuff. And there was just a lot of really nice um, chatter and discussion um, in that article. Um, about that aspect. Yeah, something that every human being can sort of, uh, you know, relate to, right? It's <laughs> how much sleep one gets and whether or not it's enough. And um, what impacts it and like, uh, okay, your partner snores. Okay, maybe too much information on that. But, you know, like, <laughs> you know, just everybody sharing stuff about like, oh, yeah, okay. It's something I can relate to and, and add on to. So. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so, um, Miriam, in, you know, you talk about kind of delving into some more cut and dried science, um, which I'm sure is a big part of a part of your studies there. Are, are you reading um, mostly in textbooks or are they scientific articles or what kind of materials are you assigning in those cases? Yeah, they're scientific articles. Um, and so for them, it's a new um, thing to do as well and, and to start parsing through that, what is good about it, what is not so good. And it's a wonderful way. It's a wonderful tool to start teaching them. And again, they're not so much um, in, in that instance where I'm using it for the first time for them to start looking at an article and critically um, appraise an article, then it's easy for me to highlight and put things up there for them to, to see um, before then I have them to start doing the same thing. So. It sounds like you do a lot of preceding of the work, like adding your own questions to kind of get the right. discussion going. Right. Got it. Yeah. Well, the, a, a real deep scientific article is a pretty. It's it's a kind of reading that not a lot of people have had a lot of practice doing. Right. right. And so I can imagine that um, some guidance there uh, works well. And it's like I've we've heard other educators talk about how. Um, the practice of reading is sort of an assumed skill but there are different kind of models and templates for how to approach reading in different contexts, like with maybe scientific articles. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you're kind of using it in this mode where you're kind of modeling a certain, you're calling attention to ways that one might read this article um, that can lead them down a path that they may not have traveled before. Can I, can I ask Miriam a question? Sure, yeah. No, this is a free, free form discussion. Um, Miriam, um, 
when you say you you the term was seeding, you're doing the pre-work. Are you able to copy that from course to course, or do you do it each time you teach the class separately? Oh, it has been um, fun learning how to how to get it from one course to the next. Um, but no, because like I'll have uh, 15, 20 annotations on an article, and I'm like, oh, I do not want to do that twice. Um, so um, Matt um, from um, I guess from, you know, um, I annotate has helped me um, go through the back door on Canvas and uh, be able to copy over my stuff. So it can be done. Um, he has helped me twice um, in doing it. And I, I think now on the third time, I'll be able to do it by myself, but I'm not 100% sure. That's, that's very interesting, just because I kind of like to do that. But yes, the prep work sounds a little bit daunting yeah yeah, yeah so you've really, been awesome <laughs> you, you've uh, t I, I think you're probably talking about my colleague matt dricker um who yes. uh works a hypothesis in our support in our sorry support. yes yeah no no problem um and you know you've hit on something that i think as a as an organization we've realized and that's that there is this need to kind of have templates or templated readings that you might move from course to course or from reading to reading if you have multiple groups, like in your case. Um, and so um, the work that you've been doing, working that out now is going to be really helpful for us to figure out how to make it into a tool that everybody can use more easily. So we really thank you for that that assistance and trying to get it right, because it's so hard to design uh, software to do something if you don't have real kind of, you know, examples of what people need in front of you and so you've brought one to us so thank you for that <laughs> um and maybe maybe karen will be bringing more well you know we've got a couple of questions now from the audience um and uh i'm going to bring this one up on stage here from from chris uh so, so we can all see it and read it uh, i'll read it out loud so de depending on what and how they're annotating I'm curious if Miriam has noticed that the visual part of annotation has helped in a memory aid in students' practical work. This can be done in other settings as well, but in this text-only environment, um, you know, maybe even like thinking about the idea of the degree to which highlighting something helps, maybe mm -hmm. having a conversation pinned to it might help. Yeah, you know, that's a really great question, and I haven't assess that like okay so is learning better when they um when they are doing that highlighting and responding and answering questions um you know certainly i do when i do my quizzes for you know test i i mean i do ask questions that come from the article i think it maybe is less daunting when i do that but i haven't you know really said oh do students learn that or do more students get that answer or get that question right um, because they were um, engaged in it? it? Would seem to to make sense of doing that. It's a good a good question. Yeah, and feel free to jump in if you have anything to add in any of these, Karen. I've got another question teed up for you though. So, um, yeah, and I, I would just follow up with that that you know there's just starting to be um, a lot more deep research into. Um, what the impact of social annotation is on various kinds of student success. Um, and so that question about um, whether or not the act of annotating can have an effect on other student performance, you know, or assessments um, is uh, kind of a, an open question so far. There's tons of anecdotal evidence that there's a lot of benefit to it. Mm -hmm. But um, the really rigorous studies are just kind of starting to kick off now, including one that's happening at um, Indiana University. Um, and it's just the first year of, or the first semester of it is coming to a close or it just came to a close, I guess, um, this spring. And so we'll start to see some outputs of that. It is in the English composition discipline as opposed to um, you know, medical. Um, but uh, can, I'll put a link in in just a second about that too. Mm -hmm. And we're we're uh, we've had a scholar in residence, Rami Kalir, over the past year, who's been helping kind of foster uh, educators who have research questions and to try to think through how those might be pursued in a in a kind of more formal way. 
it gets, as you know, it gets pretty complicated with IRB and, you know, all the different kinds of things that one might do if one's going to really do a formal study. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Karen, uh, another question has come up here um, from John, and I'm going to pull it up on stage. This one is short, but maybe sweet. Have you ever used social annotation to practice case analysis? And I haven't. Um, and that's primarily just because I don't use the case method for teaching. I think it would be an excellent tool to do so. I think getting the students, whether they be in teams as, as Miriam's done or doing it individually, my classes tend to be smaller. I tend to be certainly below 30. Um, but I think it would be an excellent tool to discuss it, um, cases and, and get into the depths and keep pushing um, each other as the students go through it. One thing I just want to go back, Nate, on, on whether there's a benefit for the social annotation. Um, so one of the clear reasons why I wanted to use this, well, there's a couple reasons. Um, one was discussion boards, can I be really blunt? We, we still have Blackboard. <laughs> Discussion board. Technically, this is being recorded, but because these okay. are oh, conversations. Not bad. Yeah, right. Not bad. So, discussion boards, I find for me, are a real challenge. Unless I'm in there two or three times a day, nudging them and egging them on, and I'm going, oh my goodness, you know, this wasn't my thought of a full time job was to, to keep students going in the discussion board. Um, it's really hard to get them engaged in a discussion board, any kind of thing like that. So I actually do use a separate tool. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention it, but for discussions separately, okay? And then I have the social annotation and it's meant to really focus on the reading. And what I've noticed, A, the discussions all over have improved and B, their assignments and their work. Just because they're actually reading I have a better discussion board tool. I have a social annotation. I'm giving them lots of opportunities to think and talk and integrate their learning. And then when I have to grade their assignments, it's just so much better. So uh, from my perspective, it's a, it's a total win. Do I have actual proof? Um, mine probably would be um, grading time. Just because their assignments are better and I'm focusing on the finer grading elements like you need to better critically analyze this versus you don't understand that term go back and read the text so it's just a different level of discussion that i'm having with the students with the vast majority of the students this is not the panacea or the silver bullet but it definitely is a uh, super strong tool I think that's my yeah. long answer to a multiple questions. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. So again, you know, more anecdotal evidence, if you will, that there's kind of an improvement. And I'm, I'm interested particularly in this this element of um, how, uh, you know, it may, the, the fact that there's a new way to engage with reading has led to these other kind of benefits, even in discussion forums, right? Um, and in the assignments as well. Um, and it's almost as if um, we've all we've been assigning readings for centuries, millennia, right? <laughs> but um, it's all you know. It's it's always been difficult to motivate people to get deeply involved with them, and when they do, it's difficult to know that they have, right? Except through you know the degree to which they can bring it out in an essay or an assignment or so, or a test, right? Um, and so this is I, one of the things that attracts me to social annotation as an educator is just this idea that it gives us a new powerful way to actually make it worthwhile to read, right? Like it, it gives it gives people a new motivation to actually want to go to the text and read it. I can I can grade it. They provide grades. They enjoy the camaraderie, and even for the fully online courses, I'm I'm actually going to use it in my in person MBA class in the fall. So I'll let you know how it goes, because I'm wondering what their um, feeling about it will be. So an MBA, professional MBA, which means, again, non-traditional students, they either buy in or they don't. There's not a whole bunch of middle ground. So nah, we'll see what happens. 
That sounds like my group of students, Karen. <laughs> they either buy in or they don't. And mine are all a face to face class. So mine, I don't, I do this with my face to face classes. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to follow up on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and maybe start with you, Miriam. So, because a lot of people, I think, especially over this past pandemic year, have really used social annotation mostly in like an asynchronous remote mm -hmm. context, right? Uh, so, could you talk a little bit about how you weave it into a synchronous face to face class? Yeah. And, you know, it's not really all that different than, you know, getting um, small groups together um, asynchronously instead of doing breakout sessions or whatever. I, well, you find in that too. But anyway, um, but yeah, so they could. Um, and this was actually before Hypothesis developed. Um, uh, the, the ability to create sections in Canvas and then have the small ones. I just I would get the students together. They would discuss the information and then they would type their responses from their group and then another of course i had five or six groups around the room so everybody was typing in and kind of having that conversation but they were doing it on the on the side first but i mean even face to face as as a um, class prep assignment could be you know part of that like karen said i am not a fan of the discussion boards in general i, I and so if i could have a article and the students have a discussion on the article, I would much, much prefer um, that, th to see that than to have a discussion board on Canvas. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like, um, I guess the, the thing that I always come back to is how um, so often in a discussion board, you are talking about something in a text, right? Or maybe you're right. relating back to something in a text, and yet it's not there. The text isn't there. And so you have to go somewhere else and maybe copy something or if try to some complicated reference to it or something. It's so handy just to kind of move that whole discussion right to on right. top of the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm uh, I'm I'm wondering too, Karen, if you you say that um, when it comes to the fall, you are um, going to have a face-to-face -face class and you're thinking to also use social annotation there, um, do you think it'll be different than you'll do it, use it differently than you have been uh, remotely? I don't think so. I'm just curious as to how it be received. So in, um, how do I express this? I teach the professional MBA capstone class. And it's an awful lot of hands-on working on a project in teams. So traditionally, this class didn't have a lot of reading associated with it. It was more, you've learned it through the MBA, now we're going to apply. And yeah, they still need to do some reading. Um, this is my third year teaching the class now, so I'm very confident that they still need to do some reading. Um, and again, I can prep them, just like Miriam was saying, it's a pre-class warm-up. It's go ahead and uh, read the articles, annotate before you come to class, so that we're all on a on the same footing is the goal. Uh, when everybody was online, they expected to do online work. I think they still will. I think they'll still be uh, fine with it. I've found it wonderful that really I've had to do um, zero prep, zero training, zero anything with a tool. There's just a link, it's click on the link and annotate. And I think pretty well, I, I do give them links to the help menus and things like that. Um, but I haven't had to do a thing and I don't think I've had to answer a question yet unless I've goofed up the PDF. And I have done that a couple of times. Um, Easy to do, you shouldn't blame yourself. The PDFs can be tricky, right? It's, and that's what I like, just because I can put them all together and it's a little bit tidier. I'm old school. Who knows which way? Um, but it works out. Um, it's just been such a good tool. I am hoping that the students in the fall will just go, oh, yeah, this works fine. It takes me a couple of hours. I go through it and now I'm ready for class. One thing that we've heard um, some other educators say even here at the conference is um, how uh, it's a little bit like a flipped classroom situation in the sense that if the students are doing reading beforehand with social annotation, there's kind of a layer of discussion that happens maybe even before you get into that synchronous discussion about it. And so um, that that when you finally do come together, whether it's face to face or online to talk about it live, 
you're actually starting from a different place than you might have been before because there's been that social annotation conversation going already. Is that? Yeah. Totally. I, I'm totally assumptive that they have done the readings and they know what I'm talking about. So um, I think, again, the compliance, it's probably not the correct term, but 99% of students do it. So it seems to be an easy uh, task. Um, I either willing to do it, they're able to do it, and they do it well. Hmm. That makes sense. Well, here's another question to shift gears a little bit. Um, I'll bring it up on stage for Mark, and I'm going to um, rephrase it even a little bit. It's not, I break it, I'm breaking this into two questions, Mark, so forgive me if I'm misinterpreting here. But so one question that I'm sort of curious about is how, if you have um, grading or assessment attached to the act of social annotation itself, so are there like assigned numbers of annotations that need to be made in order to get a grade or is it a class participation kind of thing and then the second question is maybe this thing about getting um, credit for for prior learning which is somewhat of a separate separate issue so maybe miriam can we start with you about your assessment practices here yeah and i really have just been um as more participation so of course when i first started using it it was like okay, I want to see, you know, five highlights and you can just, if the, and the reason why you highlighted it, you know, like just something really basic, just try it. And then I was like, okay, well, let's graduate to the next level. And that's like, you, you uh, like I said, need to answer a question, but I, it was really totally on participation and not, okay, you got five points if you completed the assignment. And I, of course I would scroll through everybody's to kind of see, but I wasn't grading quality of the responses, but I will say um, our students tend to be quality students anyway. So they're gonna give me, they're not gonna give me junk. So um, that's more than probably the nature of my, of my students. So definitely did not have anything other than participation points. Got it. And I don't know if there's any prior learning credit in your institution, maybe not for medical stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, not really. Mm -mm. It's not the kind of thing where, like, yeah, I treated my own headache. Can I get prior learning experience for that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about what about you, Karen? Um, uh, do you how do you work the uh, um, social annotation into the uh, actual assessment uh, of, in your course? And then what about the prior learning question as a separate thing? So uh, I think I'm kind of where Miriam said she started with, which is I do give points and I do tell them uh, how many annotations I expect. I am um, both an easy marker and a bit of a hard marker, i.e. if they do the work, I'll give them 100%. No problem with that. Uh, but if I say I want an annotation per article and they try and put the five annotations in the first two pages of the first article, yeah, they, they, they get credit for half an article. So I pay enough attention. Um, this might be a little bit out of line, but I find if I nail them first, early on in the class, things go really smoothly <laughs> after. So I've learned to grade hard in the early stages, and then I can relax by the end, and we're all happier. Um, I don't do the quality with grades, i.e. because if they do the work, they get 100%, so I won't give them more. But the student has now put a marker, and I try and let the students know. It's easier to do in a face-to-face -face classroom. But if I know your name at the end of three weeks, it's either really, really good or really, really bad. And the social annotation is a way to make it really, really good. So even though you can't get more than 100%, You've now got my attention, and that's kind of fun because the learning and the teaching will go to a different level. So I can't give them points, but I do try to provide some way to incentivize them to work a little bit harder or, or go beyond. Right. Yeah, Karen, I agree because it's usually embedded in an assignment when I, I give that. And so the feedback on the assignment 
can just be high praise. It can be like, wow, you know, you're doing some really nice critical thinking. I like how you're, you know, doing this. And, and you just give high praise and that will continue. And then um, for the individual that was kind of superficial, you kind of say that you're like, well, you, you, you met the criteria. What I'm looking for is for you to, you know, ramp your game up just a little bit more. I want to see this. I want to see that. And that's just, you know, the gestalt kind of piece. That makes sense. I think people are getting a really good uh, handle on on how this is working in, in both of your practices. Um, I'm wondering uh, if anybody in the audience would actually like to join us on stage and be part of the conversation, because we also have that ability. It doesn't just have to be my giant talking head and these nice folks. <laughs> And while we're waiting, if y'all want to think about that, I, I saw that um, Shauna, um, who I know is at, um, I believe at uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities, um, uh, she had uh, uh, gestured toward this anecdote that folks are saying that they get 10 minutes back in class from from social annotation uh, that are sort of is not spent maybe on the basic parts of the reading anymore. Um, something like that. I, I see a lot of nodding. <laughs> I was going to say, I think I get two to three hours of grading back a week because I teach condensed courses. So I'll, I'll I teach seven week instead of 15 week uh, for the fully online. But just because they've read the material, it's just so nice. So now when I ask for the assignment, they're actually at least better using it. We've just clicked up a level and it's fantastic. Less, less head pounding. My forehead's filling out now it's not quite so bad. <laughs> although that keeps the wrinkles down on my when i do it to myself um so i you know that's actually maybe the first time i've heard that uh particularly that way karen where this idea that um i mean some people talk about uh well, some instructors talk about social annotation being a bit of a burden because it's this new area where you have to spend time interacting right where you might you, you might not be replacing anything, but adding it in it. So it's more work. But what I hear you see, saying, Karen, is this idea of the actual, the time spent grading going down because people have done the reading. And th I think that's the first time I've heard that. I, I mean, some of the other folks on our team might have heard it from someone else, but I think we're constantly in conversations with educators having this dialogue about, well, does is it gonna make my work easier or is it gonna make it harder? Is it gonna be more for me to do, right? And what I'm hearing from you is, it's actually maybe decreased thing, decreased it's, the work. Yeah, I, I find now uh, we've been using Blackboard and the integration of Hypothesis and Blackboard from my perspective, was very good. Uh, we're moving to Canvas in the fall, so we'll see. So I might need to hold off a little bit on that. Um, but I do believe just having that nuts and bolts, that they've read the materials. And the annotating, I'm not asking for a 10 an article. So uh, it's not like I can still guarantee that they've read every paragraph, but they had to do something. So at least I'm better prepared. And it's fairly easy for me if I read an assignment and it's just totally off base, it's like, hey, you didn't do the readings. Shh, go back. Um, so it, I find it less frustrating, quicker time. And, and actually, I may, be, I may be mispronounced your name. I'm not sure if it's Shauna or Shana. Sorry about that. <laughs> I should know better, but uh, yeah, she's, she's um, she's agreeing that that's what they're seeing the same kind of thing in minnesota um and that actually led me to like a whole other uh question and that is um oh first i wanted to say karen that i think you'll find the transition from blackboard to canvas to be probably um better even only because um, we've been able to do some things in the canvas environment that we haven't been able to do in the blackboard environment and um Canvas is actually a little bit easier to work with it, um, from a tool integration standpoint. And so we have a tendency to roll new things out there first um, and then bring them to the other LMSs later. So you may, I, I, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that you'll be um, happily surprised when you uh, when you get onto Canvas. Not that not that we're trying to plug Canvas here or anything. Every LMS is, is fine. Um, we're agnostic when it comes to that. Um, so, uh, but that led me to this other uh, 
you know, kind of idea in question that I'm wondering what you guys think about. And that's um, uh, whether or not, um, you know, just as as teachers in your practice, if um, by using social annotation and, and kind of getting that extra level of engagement around the reading, or at least knowing that the, there's that level of engagement about the reading and being able to kind of make it visible and, and interact with it. Um, is that changing um, what you think about assigning as readings at all? And that maybe start with Miriam. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing this at you out of the blue, so you might need to <laughs> think about it. Um, I, I think if I understand you correctly, Nick, you're asking if the fact that the students will be doing social annotation, if that changes like what article I pick to, for them to read. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I would say, no, I'm not that exciting. I mean, like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't have really typically controversial um, readings or so. They're a lot more cut and dry. Um, so I would say... No, you know, that some that would be richer for social annotation versus I'd say no. <laughs> I'm sure Karen probably has a lot, <laughs> might have a, have a different take on it, but no. I, I'm potentially, first off, I'll say that um, I love OER, so open educational resources. And so hypothesis can, I don't want to say mimic, but do some of the things that the big textbook publishers are trying to do, i.e. to make sure that students actually read the materials. Uh, but this is in a more social environment. I get to choose the readings. I get to put them together. Um, I'm currently developing a course on entrepreneurial management, and it's all the boring nuts and bolts stuff. And I'm really looking forward to a hypothesis with it because I am putting in some um, readings that are... Uh, I want to say theoretically scaffolded, i.e. I'm hoping that they are scaffolded. They are in my brain. We'll see what the students think about it. So easier, harder, harder. And I have one where it's like five articles, which is a fair bit for undergrads who are in a condensed course. Um, but I'm hoping that they'll be able to help each other go, but wait, isn't this the same concept that we used in the first article? And I told them that there would be multiple concepts and terminologies, but we'll see how it will work. So I'm hoping the answer is yes, and that I don't think I would have had the nerve uh, to give them these readings without the social annotation capabilities of that. There's no wrong answer. I can write in here, huh, what the heck is this all about? And I actually don't get dinged by the instructor. Other students come in and help me figure it out. So um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and so do you in your when you bring together your different texts that you've selected, are you? It sounded like you're primarily bringing them together as PDFs inside Blackboard up till now. Yes. So okay. I have been, and and I know there's other ways to do it, but I make it one assignment so I can group everything together, and I think that's still you know a small vestige of my control issues. I am being um, slightly silly, so. No, not at all. I, I, I'm really uh, totally appreciating your perspective here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, I, I, I really want to, would you be willing to come up on stage, Shauna, so you can at least correct your pronunciation, my pronunciation of your name? <laughs> You're saying all sorts of good sorts of stuff in chat. Oh, wait, we have a raised hand. Yes, that means that we can invite her up on stage. So I'm going to bring her up on stage so she can finally school me on how to say her name correctly. Hello, we see Hi. you and hear you. I looked to my other camera. I'm sorry, I don't mean, I'm sorry, I'm putting so many comments, but you're, Miriam and Karen, your, your comments are just making me put so many ideas through my head. So I really appreciate this conversation. And Nate, you were right, it is Shauna, so okay. spot on. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. I respond to anything, so. Oh yeah, me too. I'm just like, don't call me late for dinner. So, so um, actually, while you're here, Shauna, what if you could explain a little bit about what your focus is um, at Minnesota, like what what is your work like, and sure. kind of answering the same question of how you got involved with social annotation. Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, well, I'm an I'm an academic technologist, so I'm not faculty. I'm not teaching, but I support 
all of those of you who are. Um, and we got involved, we've been pursuing hypothesis um, before the pandemic came. And then when the pandemic hit, we said we need something else to add, you know, to give faculty another tool in their toolbox for teaching. And so we did a pilot with Hypothesis and Hypothesis was fantastic. Um, I work in the College of Liberal Arts. We have 14,000 students um, on the Twin Cities campus at the University of Minnesota. We did a very limited pilot, um, which is what let me, which is why we did these evaluations. We did evaluations both in the fall semester and spring as a way to decide if we were going to ask the university for some money to support this. So that's where we did um, focus groups with faculty who used it. We had um, constant contact with them through the semester and did student evaluation. So that's where my reflections are coming from is um, from these, we had about 30, I would say 30 to 35 faculty use it each semester about there. Interesting. And is that, is that faculty across different kinds of discipline? I mean, I know you're in liberal arts and sciences, but. Yeah, liberal, um, philosophy, history, languages, world languages, English, composition, um, and religion, I said. You know, that actually brings me to a question that could be a really big help to me, Shauna, maybe if you could help. We, we're having a world languages panel mm -hmm. here, and we have some really great uh, faculty who are going to be joining that. But the one thing that I'm missing, because I had somebody pull out, is somebody, a, lang a world language teacher, who's working in a language that doesn't use a Latin alphabet. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I don't know if you have anyone. I did not have anyone try that. Oh, no, I did. I did have a Russian, in Russian. I did have a Russian professor. Yeah, do you think they would be willing to, uh, at the very last minute, pop into something? Let me <laughs> pop them an email and see. <laughs> okay, no pressure. If um, nothing else, I could get some feedback from him. I'll be there tomorrow, so. Okay, great. Um, trying not to take over the comments again. So. Oh, no, this, I mean, this this uh, office hours is supposed to be exactly this, where we just kind of casually get together and so. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that you've been so active. Um, and I'll just say that uh, one of the reasons when it comes to world languages, uh, you know, obviously you can annotate any text, any text that is annotatable in any language can be the target, right, of annotation. Um, mm -hmm. And even there are some difficulties in languages that um, move in different directions, so up and down or <laughs> mm -hmm. right to left as opposed to left to right, but it's, it's all sort of solvable. But one of the real big strengths is the annotations themselves can actually hold almost anything, certainly mm -hmm. in terms of language, any alphabet, um, any language in those alphabets, um, also equations, and you may have also been using pictures and videos, and I was going to actually ask about that. Um, but I see that we're actually getting really close to the end of the hour, and you guys probably all have other stuff to do. And so I'm, I'll just stop with that and say, um, uh, and I'll ask all three of you now that, that Sean is up here too, starting with Miriam. Um, do you, Miriam, do you have a favorite annotation that you've come across um, that you could kind of talk about that you've seen a student do? Putting you on the spot, boom. Yeah, I don't know. Um, one that like I said, I, I can't think of one in particular. Like I said, I really enjoyed the annotations on the on the sleep. Um, just uh, just all of that discussion was was really um, it was good. I'll and have say. your students mostly been making textual annotations, or have there been things like pictures or videos or equations? <laughs> um, mostly all textual. I'm the one that will add in other links to other articles or links to other entities. If, if the article mentions something that I don't think that they'll be familiar with, then I'll go out and get that resource and put it in the in the annotation. Right. Yeah. Link, linking is the seems like one of the first, you know, kind of advanced things to learn is, you know, making a connection out to another text. Yeah. That's great. What about, what about you, Karen? Uh, do you have a favorite annotation that you've come across or? Um, so in one of the weeks, you just have to talk, we're in business, right? You have to talk about leaderships and supervisors. So the stories that come out are just great fun about the best and the worst bosses that they've had. Uh, current, past, and, and sometimes even they're thinking about the future. So those are probably uh, some of the best ones that I've read. I don't have any off the top of my 
uh, off the cuff. Yeah, well, we but wouldn't want to violate student privacy. This, if, if you ask again, I just might go back and throw, or start getting a collection of the best annotations. So. Yeah, well, we, we wouldn't want to violate the student privacy either. Um, and have, do you find your students um, going beyond text in any of their annotations? No. 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 Something. So non, something to go for. Uh, non-traditional students, which tends to mean, even though we call them non-traditional, it tends to mean they're very traditional. So it tends to be very uh, word-based. But yes, I should try and get them beyond. I am also very word-based, so it fits with my uh, being. But I will keep nudging them. The links are a great idea. Bonus marks for links. I just may try that. Yeah. yeah. Great. What about uh, in Minnesota, Shana? Have you seen any? I know that you may not see them day to day in your work, but I don't see it day to day. But I'm in regular conversation with faculty who are using it, um, and the focus groups and the meetings we've been doing. So yes, there are some who have been really encouraging using the linking, absolutely. But uh, the dance class that they talked about in the research section, she really encouraged them to find video to to express and illustrate what they were talking about. So I love the images and we've really been encouraging it um, to get beyond text. Yeah, that's really, when I, when I heard there was a dance class, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, oh, I, I think students struggle in, in other technology I use, students really struggle to be able to use visuals to explain their thinking or to explain how they're thinking and analyzing visuals. So I love the meshing of annotation of a text with visuals so i was just thinking i could get them to uh put in a chart find a chart because we're about data and the, the visualization of data not quite as nice as dance but it could work find a chart that represents this article oh that could be fun yeah, thank you. You can also sometimes seed uh, seed this activity. I've seen some educators do this where they um, they'll start off the term with a very informal annotation thing just to get everybody's feet wet. And it'll almost I don't want to say it's a joke, but it's like, you know, a very light piece of reading that's maybe related to your discipline, but isn't, you know, a deep reading. And the, the goal is just to have them uh, annotate it with images that express their reactions to different parts, just as a kind of practice that because the image linking in images can be a little bit tricky. Um, it's not as obvious as it might seem at first. So giving people a little bit of practice can be a good thing. Well, I know it's we've now hit the top of the hour. And so I only recently learned what that meant. I that top of the hour means the hands are at the top of the clock. Um, <laughs> I guess I was raised by wolves. So anyway, we didn't have a lot of clocks. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming here. I really appreciate it. It was a great discussion. Um, and I welcome you. Please be in touch if, if you have questions um, for Hypothesis. You know I hopefully how to get a hold of our support. I know that Matt is a special favorite of some people. Um, and he's, he's with us. So thank you so much. And um, I'll let you say goodbye and get on with your day. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you.